This video is sponsored by Classic Football Shirts, the best place to get your classic and vintage football shirts. To get cheap retro palace shirts, click the link in the description below. And for an extra 10% off, use the code CFSPJ10 at checkout. Hello and welcome to the E-Crystal Palace podcast. I'm Alfonso Greenberg and in today's podcast, I'll be looking over the game against Swansea City by bringing my match review player rankings and my man and match. As well as this, I'm also going to bring you interviews with Roy Hodgson and Luka Milivojevic after the game. So let's begin. Palace extended their unbeaten run to eight matches with a solid draw at Swansea City. However, an excellent strike by Jordan Ayew denied them a third win in a row. After dominating a goalless first half, the Eagles finally edged ahead on 59 minutes when Luka Milivojevic netted his third penalty of the campaign. But with 30 minutes to go, substitute Ayew's blast and 25 yards levelled things up. Roy Hodgson's team couldn't find a way to get back ahead in the final stages, but they claimed their 18th point of the season at the campaign's halfway point to continue their recent recovery. Just as they had at Leicester City a week earlier, the visitors started the brighter and minutes into the contest Scott Dan drove a header from Yonka wide corner at Fabianski, which the keeper stopped on his goal line. And then on 10 minutes, Ruben lost to cheat one possession on the halfway line and linked up with Wilfred Zaha to create a shooting chance for Andros Townsend who obliged, and forced Fabianski into a fine full stretch save to tip the ball away from his top corner. However, moments later the Swans and their fans were screaming for a penalty when Jeffy Slap challenged and Singh from behind in the area but fortunately for the Eagles, Craig Pawson waved play on. But Palace continued to look dangerous on the counter-attack and nearly broke the deadlock when Loftus Cheek bent a shot towards the far post, after the hosts once again coughed up possession in a dangerous area. All the chances fell to Hodgson's team in the first half, with Julian Sproney untroubled throughout the opening 45. And five minutes before its conclusion, some superb direct running by Townsend saw him reach the edge of the area, and pick out the on-rushing Zaha, but his stabbed effort went wide. The goal math action dried up after the break, with both teams failing to look threatening in the final third. But in 58 minutes that all changed. Loftus Cheek tricked his way into the box and drew a foul from the Swan skipper Fernandez. And back on spot taking duties, Milivojevic waited for Fabianski to commit and then smashed the ball straight down the middle to hand Hodgson's team the lead they merited. Finding themselves a goal down, the hosts knew that they had to be more adventurous and on the hour mark Tammy Abraham finally produced a shot of note as he forced himself into the box and let fly but drilled high and wide. And then five minutes later the striker had a second opportunity when Nar Singh spit down the right and found the on-loan Chelsea man. And after a neat chest down handed him a sight on goal, Sproni came out and blocked the attempt with his legs. A second for Palace would have ended the contest and Zaha nearly produced it when a fantastic run by the industrious Townsend allowed him to play in his strike partner who could only shoot tamely at Fabianski. But such were the fine margins that their one goal lead was a fragile one and Sproni was forced to scramble across his goal line to edge a deflected Nathan Dyer cross away from danger. But with 14 minutes to go, Leon Britton's side did find a leveller in fine style. Tom Carroll laid the ball off to the substitute eye of 30 yards from goal, who dummied past Milivojevic to create some space. And he made the most of that to thump a stinger through the crowd of players and pass Sproni to hand the host a lifeline. He nearly added a second from range just a couple of minutes later, but saw a bouncing effort for his wide at Sproni's far up right. But despite plenty of late pressure from the Welsh side, Palace held on to return to South London with another useful point. It was another hard-earned point on the road for Crystal Palace as they drew 1-1 away against Swansea City on Saturday. Despite taking the lead through a Luka Milivojevic penalty, the Eagles were pegged back by a stunning strike from Swansea substitute Jordan Ayew as they had to settle for a point at the Liberty Stadium. But what did we learn from the game in South Wales? Here are five things. Number one, seeing double. Before the game, Crystal Palace boss Roy Hodgson was introduced to a Swansea City steward, who caused a stir earlier this year when he was spotted on match of the day two, due to his perceived likeness to the Eagles manager. The Swans published a video on their social media of the two shaking hands and sharing a joke, but what do you make of it? Is he really Hodgson's duple ganger? Number two, missing Christian Menteke. 
Christian Menteca was suspended for the game after picking up his fifth booking of the season at Leicester City last week, and his presence was missed, with the Eagles lacking a focal point up front. Andros Townsend and Wilfred Zaha tried hard up top, but unlike earlier in the season when Benteke was out injured, Palace did not have a cutting edge about them in the final third. They looked to fret but didn't quite have the spark to make the most of their opportunities, and this once again proves that another striker is necessary in January. Number 3. No doubts on the spot. After the debacle of last time Crystal Palace were awarded the penalty, when Christian Menteke took the ball of Luka Milivojevic, there was no such drama this time around. And the Serbian was calm as personified as he coolly tucked the ball away to ensure there'd be no doubts over him remaining as a designated penalty taker at the club. Number 4. Tompkins underlines his status as a key man. Mamadou Saka may be injured at the moment, but the form of James Tompkins and Scott Dan has shown that the Eagles can cope without him. Tompkins in particular has been impressive, and the former West Ham man has underlined his importance to the team again with another assured display with some tidy interceptions and challenges at the back. And number 5. Possession isn't everything. Crystal Palace had just 36% possession in the game but still had the better chances. While Swansea had 64% possession, they only had 7 shots on goal, whereas Palace had 13 shots and 5 on target. Much of Swansea's build-up play in the midfield area was pleasing to the eye, but they lacked a real threat in the final third for much of the game, until Jordan Ayew entered the fray as a substitute. So now I'm going to move on to my player ratings, but before I start, don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Crystal Palace for all the latest Palace news. And also, if you're on Facebook, do feel free to join our Facebook group, which is a really great place to join in with discussions and share your opinions. So like I've said there, if you are someone who likes to share your opinion and likes to upload videos, photos and any news articles you've seen online and you want to share them with Palace fans, then of course do join the Facebook group because much like a forum, it is a great place for you not only to share your opinion, but also read what other fans are saying. So if you are, if you are someone like myself who likes to read what others are saying and likes to get involved with discussions about the team, about the formation, any things like that, then do join the Facebook group because much like a forum, it's a great place to get in contact. Now another great place to share your opinion is in the YouTube comments, so if you are listening to the podcast on YouTube then do feel free to drop a comment below the video with your player ratings, rating the players performances from 1 to 10 and obviously with 10 being the best and you can do this along with your views of the game. Now the only reason I want you to do this is obviously you as the listeners come here to watch the video but what I want to do is also listen to and read what the listeners are saying so rather than you just coming to the video and listening to what, what I have to say do comment below with what you thought about the game and how you rated the player's performance so that I can look back and see how my opinion compares to yours. And also it could be that Swansea City fans and other Palace fans do come to the video. They don't only want to listen to my opinion but they also might want to read the comments section to see what other fans are saying about the game, about players' performances and so that they can also compare their own opinion uh, to you know, to theirs or to mine. So if you are someone who likes to get involved and likes to read what others have to say, then do drop, drop a comment below the video in the YouTube comments so that Swansea fans and Palace fans alike can come to the video, not only listen to my opinion, but also read what other fans thought about the game. Now, if you do want to follow any of these social media pages and join the Facebook group, then do check all the links that will be in the description below. But I'm now going to move on to my player ratings, starting in goal with Julian Sproni, who I am going to give a 6. Had little to do in the Palace goal for long periods, but made a good save when called upon to deny Tammy Abraham. So Julian Sproni here, I've given him a 6, and much like his performances have been in recent weeks, it was another solid performance from the veteran legend. Now in terms of his performance here, I've given him a 6, but really, he didn't really have that much of note to do in the game, so there isn't really too much to talk about his performance, because really, because it was quite a lackluster game, and both teams didn't have that real quality in the final third, you know, Sproni especially didn't really have that much to do, but for quite long periods of the game, because Swansea weren't really attacking, he didn't really have that much to do. But in terms of when called upon, there was one fantastic save from Tammy Abraham, who of course has just come back into the Swansea side because there's been a few injuries. And really, personally, looking at Swansea, I thought that Tammy Abraham should have been starting anyway because he's been one of their biggest attacking threats. But he started in this game, didn't really do much in the first half, but in the second half, he obviously had lovely chest down from a part, uh, across into the box, had a shot and Sproni was made himself very big and obviously used his feet to deflect the ball out for a corner. So although Sproni was very quiet for large periods of the game, when called upon, when a brilliant, uh, you know, skilled Tammy Abraham came, got a ball over the top, 
chested it down and had a shot on goal. Spironi was able to make himself big and obviously make him, you know, make that save. And, you know, that's something that we've criticised all keepers for last season, this season, is the fact that Wayne Hennessy, yes, he may be a good keeper on his day, but he doesn't make these important saves that keep us in the game and he doesn't make the simple saves. Whereas Spironi, what we've seen in the last few games, yes, his reflexes might be getting slower, but he's still able to make these really important saves in terms of keeping us in the game. And, you know, when you think about this game and the reason I've given him a six, yes, he was quiet for basically the whole game. He didn't really have that much to do. But the fact that when you call upon him to make that really good, important save is fantastic to see. But if you look back at the past games, you know, you look at the Leicester game where he made that save from Mares. You look at the Watford game where he made a few saves, the Bournemouth game. So the, all of these games, Spironi's made really important saves which have actually kept us in the game and helped us to go nine games unbeaten. So really, you've got to give credit to him in the fact that even though our defence gives him relatively good uh, protection in the fact that the opposition don't get that many chances, but when he is called upon, he's able to make the saves. But Julian Spironi here, I've given him a six. Long may his time in the first team continue and hopefully in the next few weeks with him, you know, getting more games under his belt, his performances can improve even more. But Julian Sproni here, very quiet game, but made a very good save from Tammy Abraham. Now to move on to the right back Martin Kelly, who I am going to give a 6. Continue that right back after his performance at Leicester City and put in another steady showing. So Martin Kelly here, much like his performance against Leicester City where he came into the side and actually put, a, put in a solid performance, once again here against Swansea City, he's now getting a run in the team and he continued that form on from that game last weekend and actually put in another solid performance and although we didn't get the clean sheet here I still thought that his defensive contribution was actually very good in the game and when you consider he's one of the scapegoats in terms of Palace fans blaming Martin Kelly for our losses at the beginning of the season last season as well actually I thought that under Sam Allardyce last season under Roy Hodgson this season that actually Martin Kelly's changed into a new player and actually at the moment whether it's because he's playing for a new contract, but whatever it is, I think his form is improving and he's becoming a better player the more he plays. But in terms of this performance here, like I've said already, continued his performance against Leicester City. I think I gave him a 6 out of 10 anyway, so he put in a, a solid performance there, done what he had to do going forward and defensively. And much like the game last weekend, he'd done exactly, he'd done exactly the same here. It was almost a carbon copy of that performance against Leicester City other than the clean sheet and to be honest he didn't do anything wrong in this game so most people you know use him as a scapegoat purely because he used to make mistakes last season but like I've said already last sort of the end of last season and this season he's actually played all right and actually in this game he'd done nothing uh, wrong of note so you can't blame him for the goal he conceded and you can't really blame him for any other sort of moments where we gave Swansea too much space in terms of you know getting through and having goal scoring opportunities but the only down thing, and you could say this is a mistake, but the only bad thing about his performance, and it didn't really affect his rating, because I still thought that it wasn't a major thing, but he did put on Palace under quite a lot of pressure, purely because he stopped getting crosses into the... He stopped, you know, he didn't stop uh, letting crosses into the area. So that's something that Joe Ward was criticised for at the beginning of the season, and he's now improved that, and he's now much better at that before he got injured. Same with Fossu Mensa, he uses his pace to obviously win the ball back off of off, off, off opponents. So really, I thought that Martin Kelly, yes, he done all right defensively for most of the game, but there were a few times where he put us under unnecessary, pr unnecessary pressure purely because he failed to stop crosses coming into the area. And that's something that, of course, Roy Hodgson, he's got experience, he can you know improve that and get it drilled into Martin Kelly and the whole of the defence to stop crosses coming in. But if I had to be really nitpicky and pick out one thing about his performance which wasn't great is the fact that he let too many crosses come in. But other than that, obviously yes we didn't get the clean sheet but I thought it was a very good um, you know, defensive performance from him. And when you consider Fossu Mensa was on the bench uh, for this game, you know, obviously Marty Kelly's doing something right in training to obviously keep Fossu Mensa out. Who realistically before Ward got injured Fossu Mensa was the replacement in the side. But Martin Kelly here, he's obviously continued at right back. I thought he'd done another, had another good performance following on from his good performance since coming back into the side against Leicester City. And once again here, I've given him a six because it was once again another steady showing. Now to move on to the captain, Scott Dan, who I am going to give a six. Made a couple of timely interceptions and challenges in a solid defensive effort. 
So Scott down here, I've given him a 6 and I'm going to keep repeating myself for most of the defence purely because I thought they had quite similar performances in the fact that they were quite solid and as a team, as a unit, I thought they worked really well and that's why compared to the beginning of the season where we were leaking in goals, we're actually conceding significantly less goals now and I think that's down to, yes, the players obviously improving their form and the fact that we've gone on a run where we've obviously unbeaten in eight. But it's not just a confidence thing. I think it's the organisation that Roy Hodgson has brought into the side. And I personally think that Scott Dan has been one of these players who's obviously been rejuvenated under Roy Hodgson because Scott Dan, beginning of the season, he was getting ripped apart by opponents. But now I'm starting to see a more solid performance. I'm see, yeah, I'm seeing more solid performances from him. And I personally think that's down to Roy Hodgson's organisation. But in this game here, obviously with him being the captain, I thought he marshalled the team quite well, got the organisation all right. But I thought overall, in terms of his performance, there were quite a lot of timely interceptions and challenges. So he wasn't necessarily having a fantastic game defensively, but he was making sure he could time his interceptions right to stop a Swansea attack. And also there was quite a few tackles and headers away that obviously he used to, you know, you know, get the ball out of danger. And that's all, all of that adds together to sort of our solid defensive effort altogether, because it wasn't just one player defensively he was fantastic but I thought as a whole the defensive effort in terms of the back four the goalkeeper and Milivojevic in front of the defence I thought that they all worked together as a unit and really did play well quite defensively but in terms of you know looking at the game as a whole I thought he held firm at the back and when you consider Swansea they've got quite a lot of attack oh sorry got quite a lot of pace on the attacks you know running in behind with Dyer and are you when he came on so they've got a lot of pace and obviously Scott Dan Tompkins Kelly they're not really the fastest fastest players but I still thought that they dealt with them threats going forward and actually like I've already mentioned already when you consider the pace that Swansea have got up front and it's quite surprising that they're bottom of the league when they've got that quality up front but there was quite a lot of times where they ran in behind and Scott Dan once again made these interceptions and challenges to win the ball back and obviously stop Swansea's pace from punishing us but in terms of his overall performance as a captain, I thought he'd done a, you know, done a good job of marshalling the troops, let's say. But I've given him a six, not because it was a fantastic defensive performance, but like I've said already, in terms of the whole team and working well defensively, I thought he put in another solid defensive performance. And in terms of what he'd done in the game, I think it's quite important to look at his interceptions and challenges, which of, which of course did keep us in the game. Now to move on to his centre-back partner, James Tonkins, who I am going to give a seven. Another short display from Tompkins, who made some vital challenges and tiny interceptions and blocks. So James Tompkins here, I've given him a 7, and much like what I've already mentioned in terms of the team performance and in terms of working as a unit to stop Swansea's attacks, I thought that yes, the whole defence done really well, but for me, James Tompkins did stand out for me, and he was the main man in terms of stopping Swansea's attacks, and when you consider, you can't really put too much blame on him for the goal. Actually, as a whole, you know, he didn't do anything bad in the game, and you know, I'll go on to talk about the goal later, but really it was Milivojevic who got tricked, went to slide in for a tackle, and obviously oh, you went the other way. So really, you've got to, you're probably going to put most of the blame on Milivojevic for that. But overall, you can't really blame, in my opinion, many of the defenders for the goal. You could blame them for not closing are you down, but then also on the other hand, you know, Milivojevic has lost his man on the edge of the area. But in terms of Tomkin's performance here, you know, much like his performances have been this season, obviously whether he's playing alongside Sacco, Kelly... Or Dan, I thought it was another assured display. And that's something we've come to expect from Tompkins. And it's great to see he's actually putting in consistently, you know, 6, 7 out of 10 performances every week. But much like the performance um, of Scott Dan, I thought they were quite similar. And some of the similar similarities were the fact that he made vital challenges. So in terms of stopping the pace of Nathan Dyer, I thought that Tompkins done really well in actually getting in behind and making these tackles or, or headers. And also in terms of timely interceptions and blocks. So one in particular which really stood out for me was when Swansea were on the counter-attack. Tompkins made a great interception, passed the ball to Wilfred Zaha who passed it to Loftus-Cheek. And obviously Loftus-Cheek went forth to win the penalty. So yes, Tompkins wasn't necessarily directly involved in winning the penalty. But he was the man who set up the attack in the first place and actually made that interception to get the ball to Wilfred Zaha, to get the ball to Loftus-Cheek. So actually, that attack and that goal, obviously the penalty we scored, all came from Tompkins making that interception. So that just shows that, unlike Scott Dan, who I've given the six, yes, they were both good defensively, 
But that little bit of skill in terms of that interception in particular and how important that was in terms of getting the first goal of the game. Because of that, and that's something that Scott Dan didn't do, because of that, that's why I've given him a 7 as opposed uh, to a 6. But that is really important. That's something that I like about Tompkins' game. We saw it with Scott Dan against um, Watford where he passed the ball to Zaha for both goals. And once again here, it was sort of a reverse role and it was James Tompkins who was the provider to help set up um, set up the goal and, or set up the penalty which obviously we scored from. But in terms of his performance overall, you know, I've given him a 7 but I thought he was a calm presence at the back. So once again, in terms of being a leader, yes Scott Dan was the captain but I thought that James Tompkins stayed calm at the back, made sure everyone knew what they had to do and he was very composed. And like we've already mentioned, it, you know, there were loads of good challenges and whether it be in the air in terms of winning that aerial battle or whether it be winning the tackle on the floor or on the ground, I, I thought he'd done all right in both aspects. So, yes, Scott Dan had a few chances offensively from headers, but I thought Tompkins in this game not necessarily had them offensively had any headers, but his headers in terms of defensively and in terms of getting the ball away and getting the ball out of the danger zone away from Swansea, I thought that was really great in terms of his performance. But James Tompkins here, I've given him a 7, another assured display from Tompkins, which is something we begin to expect now. And once again, he's continued his consistent performances over the last few weeks. And much like the performances of quite a lot of the defenders in this game, he made loads of vital challenges in the game. And obviously, that one interception in particular helped us to set up the goal. But James Tompkins here, I think a 7 is a fair result. Now to move on to the left-back Jeffrey Slop, who I am going to give a 6 did try to get forward when possible and had a tough afternoon defensively against the pace and trickery of Nathan Dyer. So Jeffrey Slup here, I've given him a 6 and some could argue I should give him a 5 for this game and some may argue that I'm actually right to give him a 6 but do comment below what you think but I personally think given the benefit of the doubt and considering I've you know slated him for not going forward recently in this game he tried to get forward a lot more than he has done in past games and for that reason is one of the main reasons I've given him a 6 as opposed to a 5 as some people would argue. But in terms of his performance defensively obviously we didn't keep the clean sheet but in terms of stopping Nathan Dyer who was the main attacking threat on Jeffrey Slup's side yes he had a difficult afternoon against him but I thought he'd done an alright job against him so it wasn't really a best job he didn't do the best job in terms of stopping and nullifying Nathan Dyer's attacking threat but he'd done enough to obviously stop Nathan Dyer and restrict him to as little chances as possible. So in that respect, he'd done all right. But when you consider the trickery and pace that Nathan Dyer's got, although Slup's got pace, he hasn't got the trickery and he's going to find it quite difficult to obviously cope, uh, you know, in terms of defensively against Nathan Dyer. But I still thought he'd done a respectable job there. And when you consider, you know, he's slowly getting back into that, you know, that left back role. And in terms of the fact that he's keeping Vanana out, Vanana out of the side shows that actually not only to the fans but to Roy Hodgson he's doing the right things and long may it continue. But I still would like to see him have a little bit more influence in the game and that's why some would give him a 5. But I think a 6 is a fair result for him. But in terms of the first half obviously he was quite involved in terms of Swansea once again using their pace to get in behind. Obviously I think it was Narsing, uh, I think it's Lucio Lars Narsing. I'm sorry if I butchered his name. But he was running through on goal and obviously Jeffrey Slup made the challenge. Swansea, you could have appealed for a penalty there. But, you know, it wasn't really a big deal. I think it was quite a fair challenge. Jeffrey Slup got a little bit of touch on the ball. So really, I don't think there's a debate there. It's just a good challenge. And the fact that nobody really made a big deal about it. The players, maybe the fans did, but the players on the field didn't. It just shows that it was a fair challenge. They got up and carried on with the game. But that just shows... You know, it was a bit of a odd moment, really. A bit dangerous because he went in for that challenge. It could have gone wrong because it was from behind. But luckily, he sort of got a touch on the ball, so it didn't count for that. So really, that's probably why people could argue he should get a five. Because he made that... It wasn't. I wouldn't say it was dangerous tackle, but it, will, it could have put us into a situation where within the first few minutes, we would have had a penalty against us. But I thought Narsing, great to get in behind. But once again, Jeffrey Slop, great to get the ball off of him. But in terms of his performance overall, I've already mentioned this, but the reason I've given him a 6 as opposed to a 5, which some people would give him for his below par performance, is purely because he tried to get forward when possible. So much like the games recently where I've been criticising him because he wasn't going forward, he wasn't supporting Loftus-Cheek or Zaha, in this game it was a complete opposite because whenever he, we were going on the counter-attack, he'd go forth and he'd try and link up and do 1-2s with Loftus-Cheek. And that's something we've missed this season, but it's great to see 
that in this game, obviously he doesn't take my advice because I doubt he listens to the podcast, but the fact that I picked it up and we're starting to see an improvement shows that Roy Hodgson is starting to work on not only improving and you know solidifying his defensive performance, but also making sure that he can use his pace and actually still be a threat in terms of you know going forward. And actually, because as a result of that, because he was going forward quite a lot, there were a few decent crosses he put into the box where, yes, he's normally not the best cross of the ball, but once again, doing them one-twos on the edge of the area creates a bit of space. He has time and space to think on the ball, and then he puts in some good deliveries. So once again, in this game, he's now going forward a little bit more, but he's now, when he's going forward, he's using his link-up play to create space, and obviously put more crosses into the box. But Jeffrey Slup here, some could argue give him a 5 because it wasn't a fantastic performance. I personally would argue give him a 6 because although it wasn't the greatest performance, I thought that it was great to see him actually wanting to go forward and trying to go forward whenever it was possible. And the fact that he wasn't necessarily terrible defensively, I personally think that a 6 is a fair result. But Jeffrey Slup here, a 6 for him. Do comment below with what you think. Now to move on to the defensive midfielder, Luka Milivojevic, who I am going to give a 6. Showed a cool head to tuck home the penalty, but was booked again on his return for suspension and was beaten on the edge of his own box by Ayu for Swansea's goal. So Milivojevic here, I've given him a six, and the first thing really to say is, you know, it's almost certain now that he is our penalty taker because he scored five and five now. His penalties are absolutely superb, great accuracy, great power, so there's no doubt really about that who the penalty taker is. And it's really disappointing really, we look back at the Bournemouth game, we could have won that game an extra three points. We would have been on 21 points now and it would have been a different story. But hey-ho, or maybe it was 20 points, I'm not sure. Yeah, it would have been 20 points. But the the point is, Milivojevic, he is the penalty taker. And once again here, he showed his cool head. He showed how he has calmness and literally gave the goalkeeper the, the stare and then sent him the wrong way and just literally pelted it down the middle. So that's just showing that once again, even though there's a lot of pressure on him, he stayed composed and you'll hear in the interview later on where he talks about his composure, but he just stood there, took the penalty, blasted it home and a great finish it was. But in fact, the fact that he came back for suspension was obviously a bonus for us because of how good he's been before he got suspended. And some could argue actually against Leicester where we obviously won 3-0, we played all right without him, but I thought that him coming back into the side will offer us a bit more quality and it certainly did do that. But when you consider he's just come back from five yellow cards, he got booked again here for a silly foul. So it's obviously six yellow cards this season, but because it refreshes on the new year, it's not really really that big deal in terms of racking them up and getting another ban. But in terms of the main thing that he did do in the game, because although he scored the penalty and had an alright performance defensively in terms of protecting the back four, he was beaten on the edge of his own box by RU for Swansea's goal. So if you see, look back at the replays, Yes, I'm not going to put too much blame on the defenders because obviously he's obviously wrong-footed Milivojevic. He's gone into a tackle. He's run past him and put a lovely powerful shot in between defenders. And there's no way Sperling is going to get that because he's got lovely power, lovely curl on it. So really, I can't really put too much blame on the defence or the goalkeeper purely because of how good a strike it was, how much power and the fact that he had that curl uh, to go as far reach away from uh, Sproni as possible. But you've got to put a little bit of blame on Milivojevic because he had a good game up until that point. But then he obviously said in his interview afterwards, as you'll hear, he's obviously thought he was going in for that challenge. He was going to go in for that that, that tackle, really. But then are you lovely skill to wrong foot him, dribble past him the other way. Completely wrong foot Milivojevic. He's obviously gone down to the ground. And by the time he's got up, are you's already taken the shot. So in terms of that... Maybe uh, uh, Milivojevic, yes, he's a good tackler of the ball, but when you've got a player on the edge of the area who's good at shooting, instead of trying to make that challenge and win the ball back, maybe you should just stay with him and man, man mark him and make sure that he can't get that shot away and he has to pass the ball away purely because you're not giving him any space or any chance to shoot. So rather than trying to tackle him and win the ball off of him, maybe just block him off and if the shot, he does take a shot, at least you're there to obviously block it and you know it rebounds away from you. But like I said already, on his return from his suspension, obviously for five yellow cards, I thought he battled quite well in the midfield, obviously winning tackles, uh, you know, making blocks, interceptions. And actually, there was quite a lot of time where he showed quite good good composure. So it wasn't just with the penalty where he had that cool head and that composure to slam it home. But also there was quite a lot of time where there was quite tight situations. Swansea are putting on pressure on us because obviously they want the three points. And 
I, I still thought that Milivojevic, when there was quite a lot of pressure on him in the midfield where he didn't have space or time to think on the ball, I still thought when he was in them tight situations, I thought he'd done pretty good on the ball to obviously, you know, protect the back four and in terms of, you know, use the ball forward. But Milivojevic here, I've given him a six. Not one of his sort of standard performances in terms of completely bossing and winning that midfield battle. But I still thought the fact that he had that cool head to tuck the penalty home was absolutely fantastic. And although obviously we could blame him for Ayu's goal because he mistimed his challenge and got sent the wrong way by Ayu. You know, hopefully in the next few games, even though he said it, he's even said it himself, that hopefully in the next few games, if he gets into that situation again, Rather than going down to ground here, stay with his man, make sure he can't give him the space to shoot. And hopefully in the next few games we won't see situations again where he tries to make a challenge because we know he's good at it. But ultimately, you know, the player's got skill to obviously get around it and avoid that. But Milivojevic here, I've given him a 6, I think that's a fair result. Now to move on to Johan Kabai, who I am going to give a 6. Broke up play in the midfield and got forward on occasions, before coming off with 15 minutes to go. So Johan Kabai here, I've given him a 6, and much like the performance of Milivojevic, it wasn't necessarily the best performance defensively or even offensively, but I still thought he put himself about and actually put in a shift in the midfield. But in terms of Kabai's performance and the reason I've given him a 6, is mainly because of the way he broke up the midfield. So whereas Luka was obviously giving protection to the back four, Kabai was playing slightly further forward than Luka was playing, and his job was to break up the midfield and make sure that Swansea wouldn't win that midfield battle and to be quite honest to be non non biased actually I thought that for quite a lot of the game Swansea were actually winning that midfield battle and that's something I talk about every week but in order to win a game you've got to win that midfield battle and I personally thought for the majority of the game here against Swansea we didn't actually do that and that's not to say that Yoan Kabai's breaking up of play, breaking up of the play wasn't good it's just that Swansea were playing slightly better in the middle of the pot during the game but Kabai I thought done a good job of breaking up the play in the midfield and quite a lot unlike Milivojevic where he was staying back quite a lot of the time Kabai would go forward on quite a lot of occasions and help up with the attack so really what he'd done in the game was break up play and go forward so he didn't really have any real impact on the game and the you know that just all added up obviously he's tired and he's getting old he's getting older now and he can't play the full nine minutes but he put a shift about and he wasn't really playing that well in particular. Obviously hence why I've given him a 6. So he got taken off with about 15 minutes to go. Not to say that his performance is bad. Just because he was looking a bit fatigued and a bit tired. And maybe because of that tiredness it could lead to a mistake. Rather than have him make the mistake and we moan about it. Take him off. Save him for the next game against Arsenal. Which obviously he likes because he scored against them last season. So leave him for that. Keep his fitness up. And we'll go again. Um, we'll go again. But in terms of his performance, you know, yes, in the midfield he was breaking up play, and actually he was quite heavily involved in breaking up the play. And then from dead ball situations, so corners and and free kicks, any sort of set pieces, he actually put in some good uh, deliveries into the box. So yes, he didn't have the best game, but there were a few times in the game where there was a certain tackle or interception he made to break up the play. In the midfield, there was a few set-piece deliveries which were good. One in particular which landed on Dan's head which went just wide. So actually, yes, he had an under-par game and he didn't play particularly well, hence why I've given him the six. But actually, there were a few little chances where if he had done that throughout the whole game, he probably would have got a seven. But because he only showed bits of quality in certain parts of the game, that's why I've given him the six. But hopefully, obviously he's getting older a bit now and he can't carry on you know, and play the full 90 minutes. But hopefully in the next few games, he can continue to make an impact on the team. Now to move on to James McArthur, who I'm going to give a 6. Put in the shift as usual, but his touch let him down on a couple of occasions. So James McArthur here, I've given him a 6. And in terms of the game last week against Leicester, he was probably one of our standout players. And for me in particular, I put him forward for the man of the match. And I thought that he had such a great performance there against Leicester. I thought that... Because Benteke suspended, Milivojevic will come back in the side, will go back to a 4 4 2, and McCarth will, will retain his place in the side. And rightly so, I thought the last few weeks he's been performing, performing well. Obviously, he scored against Watford, score, um, obviously, played good against Leicester. So actually, he deserved to keep his place. And I personally thought I had no problem in having him in the side. And actually, the starting 11 was exactly what I predicted in my preview to the game. But in terms of his performance, much like Kabai, it wasn't fantastic and that's why 
I've given him a, a six. But something you always can rely on with McCarthy is he puts in a shift. He always gives you. He always puts in effort in the game. And in this game, it was exactly that. He put in effort, no real quality. And actually, yes, we know he scored a few goals this season, and he's got quality on the ball. But there was quite a lot of times here against Swansea where his touch did let him down on a couple of occasions. So when he could have gone forward and thread, uh, threaded through Zaha in particular, where he picked up the ball, because he took a bad touch, Swansea were able to take the ball off of him. Whereas if he had an improved touch, he would have been able to pass it to Zaha, thread him through on goal, and maybe Zaha would have scored from that. So little things like that, you know, in terms of the touch, where he took a heavy touch or a bad touch, and he wasn't able to pass it to the right person. Or even it's just that he weren't looking. So he weren't concentrating. And actually he weren't looking for the pass. And he was trying to shoot. Where really it would have been better for him to thread the ball through to someone else. But in terms of a word I've used quite a lot to, you know, this season to explain his performances. Is combative. And, you know, this was another game where he was combative. He was fighting, fighting in the midfield. Putting himself about a bit. And like always puts in a shift. But like I've said already. All of that's great, but if you do all of that and put in the effort, but then you, your touch lets you down where you could thread someone through or, you know, score a goal. When that lets you down and Swansea able to counter and, you know, counteract what you've just done, it's really useless because you can put in all the effort. But if you make that mistake at the final minute with that final product, nothing really isn't going to work. And to be honest, yes, I've given him a six. It wasn't the best performance, but he put in a shift. And to be honest... If you look at the game as a whole, he wasn't as effective as he was against Leicester. And, and maybe that's because he wasn't playing so defensive, so he had a more central role. And maybe he'd prefer to have either an attacking or defensive role. Or whether it's because him, uh, Kabai and, and Milivojevic work better together as opposed to having a midfield three. And maybe that's because we tried to play with midfield players when actually we should have played with width. But because our midfield was quite crowded, maybe that affected MacArthur's game. So do comment below what you think about his performance. And based on who I've seen in this game and based on the fact that Benteke is coming back and he's sh hopefully back on form, I personally think that if there is a player to drop out of the side, then it'll be MacArthur and Milivojevic and Kabai will go back to that defensive midfield role. But in terms of his performance, you know, performances against Arsenal Man City that are coming up, because obviously in my, I predict he won't start the game because Benteke is back, I still think he'd be quite a useful player to bring off the bench in terms of replacing Kabai with about 15 minutes to go when Kabai starts to tire. But James McCarthy here, I think a 6 is a fair result. Now to move on to Ruben off the cheek who I am going to give a 7. Tried to get forward when possible and came close to scoring in the first half. Got the assist for the goal as he went down in the box under the challenge from Fernandes. So Ruben off the cheek here, I've given him a 7. And much like his performances have been in recent weeks and this season, he was absolutely fantastic again. And although this wasn't one of his best attacking performances because once again he was playing out wide I still thought he didn't let that affect his game and he still tried to have an influence on the game and that's the thing I liked about his performance because Jeffrey Slup was actually supporting him more it meant that Loftus-Cheek was able to go forward even more and try to go forward whenever possible and because he had that link up play with Jeffrey Slup it meant that going forward we were slightly more effective but to be honest that's all great that obviously he tries to go forward and tries to you know, tries and scores and tries to put crosses into the box. But all, he doesn't always pick the right option. So this is something I mentioned a few weeks ago. In the fact that there was a game a few weeks ago where he was on the edge of the area three or four times. And he passed the ball as opposed to shooting when actually he was in a perfect position to shoot. And that was his indecision. Whether it's because of his confidence or he just wants to be a team player. Whatever it was, in that game in particular, instead of shooting, he was able to be a team player and cross the ball. Whereas in this game... It was almost the opposite in the fact that, you know, he tried to shoot when actually sometimes that wasn't the right option. And maybe it would have been better to playing a teammate like Zaha, like Townsend, as opposed to keeping the ball for himself and, you know, go, going forth and scoring himself. But the thing I must say about his performance, you know, the one time that that did work when he took the ball and took his chance himself was in the first half. So he obviously got played through by, I believe it was Townsend or Wilf. So they were both playing on that side for whatever reason. Threaded the ball to off his cheek, he's cut inside, has a shot from just outside the area and it goes just wide. So he was, other than Townsend's shot, which we're going to talk about later, but Loftus cheek, a few minutes after, had that shot as well and it went just wide so he was showing an attacking intent. But other than that shot, there was a few other chances later on in the game where actually it would have been better for him to shoot or to pass to a teammate. 
But in terms of the goal, obviously we scored Milivojevic from the penalty spot. Great penalty, like I've said already. But the fact that Loftus-Cheek was able to run into the box, use his trickery to get past the player, so he has to stick his leg out. And there's no question about it. They talked about it on match of the day. Yes, it's a bit stupid for Fernandes to do that, and it's a soft penalty. But if you've got a player running into the box, and you stick out your leg and hook, it, and hook the opponent's leg, and it goes down to ground, that's a very clear penalty because... The player's being stupid enough to leave his leg out. Whether it's clumsy or not, yes, it's a soft penalty, but it's a, a silly decision from the defender. Very clumsy, and obviously Loftus-Cheek has capitalised on that. So, I've said already that it was great that Tompkins was the guy who intercepted the ball, passed to Wilf, and then passed to Loftus-Cheek. But Loftus-Cheek as well, he didn't, obviously, saw he saw three or four men behind, um, you know, besides him. Instead of just, you know, passing the ball back out wide to put a cross into the box, he used his you know great strength to run through the box run past two or three players and then ultimately Fernandez was there to trip him up so it's great that he's got that determination to run through on goal and ultimately for us that led to us uh, getting the goal but to be honest that just showed he really just sort of epitomizes what he'd done in this game and the fact that he always tried to go forward and like I've said already you know that that curled effort if that had gone in because it just went just wide if that had gone in it would have been a whole different story we would have been 1-0 up at that point and maybe the, we would have been cruising towards the end of the game. But to be honest, he's still being played out of position. So I've given him a 7 here because he won the penalty and he looked to go forward with the help of Jeffrey Slup. And obviously he got the assist for uh, the penalty. But he's still playing out of position but he still does a job there. So although he's less effective out wide than he would be down the middle. But he's still not letting that affect his game and he's not getting upset about it. And he's still doing what he can for the team and... Something I've heard on other podcasts is people talking about Roy Hodgson. He likes to play a four, um, you know, a four-four-two system, which means that Loftus Cheek has to play out wide, and ultimately it's working for Roy Hodgson at the minute. So why change it? And I totally accept that. But when you've got someone like Wilfred Zaha and Townsend who can play out wide, and you play Loftus Cheek down the middle, it's better to do that because you're utilising all three players' skills. And yes, we couldn't do that in this game because Benteke was suspended. But hopefully, in the next few games. We'll start playing a, a more expansive, maybe 4 3 3 or 4 2 3 1 formation, and hopefully that will utilize Loftus Cheek skills. Because although in this game he's shown that he can play out of position out wide, we're seeing parts of the game where actually he'd be more better and we'd be utilizing his skills better if he was playing down the middle. But Loftus Cheek here, the Chelsea Loney, another solid performance from him and a 7 for him. Hopefully, in the next few games, he can carry on his good performances and hopefully when he's eventually moved back down into the middle he can influence games even more. Now to move on to Wilfred Zaha who I'm going to give a 6. Not his best game, had a couple of chances that he could have done better with and was booked. So Wilfred Zaha here I've given him a 6 and unlike his performance last week where he scored against Leicester and against midweek a few weeks ago obviously where he got the two assists against Watford this was a slight off game and ultimately the best players in the league you know your Hazards your Maratas, your Alexis Sanchez's, these sort of players, they have great runs of form and then ultimately they have an off game here and there. And you know, Zaha, he's been great the last few games, been absolutely monumental in terms of getting us them two wins uh, last week. But this game, it was one of his off games and if you look at the game as a whole, he probably was not, I wouldn't say the worst player on the pitch, but he certainly wasn't one of the best, which he normally is. He's one of the more influential players on the pitch and certainly it wasn't his best game game but like Townsend on the other on the other I wouldn't say the other wing but I wouldn't say the other strike partner because it was a very messed up formation formation we were playing it was meant to be a 4-4-2 but because they're unorthodox or they're orthodox wingers and they're playing down the middle of strikers it doesn't quite fit but let's say his strike partner in Townsend I thought that they were quite similar in the fact that they both had chances to score whereas Townsend took his chances and was unlucky because the keeper made a good save Whereas Zaha, he had a few chances and probably should have done better with them. And just to sum up his overall performance, you know, he didn't have his best game. He's obviously missed loads of chances. And then ultimately he was booked as well, which really just sums up that fact that it was quite a uh, lackadaisical, let's say, performance from him. And that's why I've given him a six. But like I've already mentioned, you know, he set high standards this season and it was quite a quiet game. And although he was involved in helping us create our, our best chances, so although... He was influential in the fact that he helped to create the chances. He still didn't have any real impact on the game where we saw last week where he had that magic in terms of the step over. In this game, we didn't see anything like that. And that's something 
that we've begun to expect from Zaha because of how good he's been this season. And ultimately, like I've said already, this was a slight off game for him. But there was one chance in particular um, that I've said already he should have done better with most of his chances. But one in particular, he took too long to get the shot away. And obviously the chance was cleared and then he got booked because he clipped the, the Swansea City defender as he went to clear it. Which personally I think was a very, very harsh card to give. It should have been a free kick because obviously Zaha clipped him. But they were both going for the ball. And ultimately as the Swansea players cleared it, Zaha's clipped him. So it's not yellow card. But it is still a foul. But that just shows really how he was having an off game. The fact that he took too long to get his shot away. He fought about it too hard. And then ultimately the ball just got taken off him. And he ultimately got booked for the full up. But Wilfred Zaha here, you know, he's been so good this season. Been so consistent. And ultimately, like I've already said, all of the best players have their off games. And unluckily for us, he had an off game here. Where really we should have capitalised. And I'm not saying we should have been guaranteed the three points. But ultimately this was a game that should have been... Uh, a, a good game for us to actually get the three points attack Swansea but ultimately we got the draw we should be happy with the draw our unbeaten runs continued but I'm just thinking looking back at the game if Zaha had had a good game maybe we would have had more chances to go for for win the game but I personally think a player for not who hadn't you know he's had his one of his worst games in a, in a few weeks you know considering how well he's been playing lately but I still think even though it wasn't his best game he still had chances chances but he still needs to do better with them but Wilfred Zaha here a 6 I think is a fair result. Now to move on to a strike partner and final player of our starting 11 Andres Townsend who I am going to give a 6. Offered a threat going forward but things didn't quite happen for him. Still put in a solid display for the team. So Andres Townsend here I think if we compare him and Zaha's performance I think we could argue that actually Townsend had a slightly better game but I've still given him a 6 because I thought the fact that he got taken off is purely just reflects on how lacklustre his performance was because although in my opinion he was offering offering you know a threat going forward things didn't quite happen for him so although he was using his pace to get in behind and was putting crosses into the box because he was playing out of position down the middle nothing really came from these attacks and you know nothing really happened for him and you know we saw against Chelsea um, towards the beginning of the season how well Townsend and Zaha worked up front but that was against a back three, so it's quite understandable that a front two versus the back three works better as opposed to a front two against your back four. So really, it's obviously going to be harder for him to attack. And actually, quite understandable, playing out of position, playing you know down the middle other than out wide, it's going to affect his game. And I still thought that he tried to do a job up there, tried to be that threat going forward, but it didn't quite work out for him. But the thing that puts him above... Zaha in my opinion and some could argue why I should give him a 7 but I've given him a 6 because it didn't quite happen for him but unlike Zaha I still thought he put in a solid display for the team so whereas Zaha had a slight off game wasn't having as much influence as he would have liked and was had loads of chances but didn't take any of them well Townsend on the other hand I still thought he put in a solid display for the team and you know he ultimately in within the first sort of half he could have actually you know scored a few goals for us and in terms of them efforts, so obviously one of them was absolutely fantastic where he cut inside from their left hand side. Lovely curling effort with his right foot. It was curling towards a uh, towards goal, top corner, and then Fabianski made a fantastic save. So that just shows Zaha didn't really have any chances, whereas Townsend, he had a chance, cut inside, put that fantastic shot in. It was lovely curl on it, lovely weight, and it was just unlucky that Fabianski made an absolutely fantastic save. Obviously, to, you know keep Swansea in the game because if that had gone in quite early in the first half the game probably would have changed and maybe we would have gone on to you know get the three points obviously scoring in the second half and maybe scoring because of the confidence of being 2-0 up but the thing I liked about his performance which once again puts him above Zaha in terms of this game it's the fact that he was a willing runner and he looked a threat so he was the guy who was willing to make runs in behind and try and get on the end of crosses and long balls so he was the guy running around quite a lot and when you consider that Wilf and Townsend, you know, they're not the tallest players, so they're going to struggle with the aerial threat. And obviously it's quite pointless putting balls up to Zaha when he's going to get bullied off the ball by the defenders. That happened quite a lot in the game, but something I saw in Townsend was a willingness to actually still run, try and still latch onto that ball and still look a threat going forward. And that's something which, in my opinion, put his performance above others. But I, I definitely think that in terms of an attacking threat, he was probably up there with Loftus Cheek, let's say, for being one of our best players. But for me personally, yes, he was one of our better players in the game. 
but I still don't think it was a fantastic performance from him. And to be honest, the last few games I've said about Townsend, he puts in the effort, but he hasn't had that real quality. And in this game here, he's improved slightly more. But what we need to see more in the next few games, so i.e. against Arsenal where he scored last season, against Man City, we might not get anything out of these games, but we want to see a little bit more end product from Townsend. And that's what would improve his performances even further. But Andrew Townsend here, I've given him a 6. He offered us a threat going forward, but things didn't quite happen for him. And, you know, and if it wasn't for Fabianski, he probably would have got the goal he deserved for putting in that sort of display. But hopefully in the next few games, he can improve his end product even more and create more chances for us. Now to move on to the subs, Bakri Saku and Pacho Renano. So I'm going to give them both fives purely because I think that they came on quite late in the game with about 15, 10, 15 to 10 minutes left of the game. So really they didn't have you know, any time to make any real impact on the game. And it may be unfair because when you're put on late onto the pitch you have got, haven't got that chance to show anything. But I've given them both a five, not because of the bad performances as such, purely because they didn't have any real influence on the game. But Bakary Sacco... Came on for Kabai, he obviously got sent up front and we changed our formation. Um, but because obviously Swansea were playing quite well defensively as well, and because we weren't really playing the correct system to get balls into the box for the striker, because of that, when Bakri Saka was sent up front, he barely touched the ball and barely got into the game. And then Patrick Van Arnold came on for Townsend, you know, I said that Townsend had an alright game, but was lacking the end product. Yes, it, I, th I think at the time it was the right decision, and obviously Patrick Van Arnold quite late, introduction didn't really have any real impact on the game but there were a few times where we could have countered but because he lost the ball we obviously didn't weren't able to counter in the last few minutes of the game so maybe that's why Jeffrey Slop still at left back as opposed to Van Arnold, because Van Arnold makes these mistakes where we could win the game in the dying stages but instead he goes forth and loses the ball but in terms of a quick summary of the game I, I do personally think that I am quite up I'm not upset or angry at the game I'm just disappointed that we weren't able to grab three points but when you consider both teams were quite bad and the fact that it was quite actually quite a tough game against Swansea City, I, I still think you know we could have got something from the game, but it was quite a, a quite a tough game. But we did expect it to be a tough game when you consider that they sacked uh, their, their manager midweek, so normally the players and the team get a boost from that. And ultimately there was an improved performance from Swansea here. But to be honest, we didn't match our performance last weekend. So you'd expect that we've had a whole week's training You'd expect us to go into this game away from home with the same intensity as we did, obviously, last week against Leicester. Ultimately, we didn't do that here and we weren't able to get the three points. And there's no doubt for me that if we had put in the same intensity and the same amount of effort and performance, there's no doubt that we would have gone on to win this game purely because it worked against Leicester, Leicester last week and against a weaker, so-called weaker uh, Swansea side who've just sat that manager off. It should have been easier for us to do that. But one of the reasons I personally think that we did struggle in this game is that Christian Benteke was obviously mi missing. And for me, it was quite evident that because Christian Benteke was missing, we were missing that focal point up front. And because Roy Hodgson is quite stubborn and he wants to play the same system, he likes to make our team very hard to beat. Because of that, it meant that we stuck with the 4-4-2 and played with two wingers as strikers and it didn't quite work out for us. And I'm sure that if we had another striker or we played... Bakary Sacco from the start maybe we would have got more out of the game because we at least would have had some sort of focal point and were able to you know change the system around that but because Roy Hodgson is very stubborn and he tries to make our team hard to beat it obviously ultimately means that we don't really have that many chances going forward because we're playing a system which he likes to play but doesn't fit the players that we had available for the day but to be honest it's a case you know it's a very good case for respecting the point you know we could go up there go all guns blazing, try and attack Swansea and then lose 2-0. But instead, we were very cautious, made sure we were hard to beat. And to be honest, respect the point. I totally agree with that because at the end of the day, a point is better than no points. And instead of risking, you know, three points in terms to try and get the win, I'd rather the points were shared and we get a point and we continue our unbeaten run to eight games. But to be honest, the main important thing about the last eight games and this game especially is that that one point yes it's only one point but it makes sure that we're out of the bottom three for Christmas which when you consider we lost the first seven games of the season it's a fantastic achievement but hopefully if we can continue the performance and mirror it the performance against Leicester against Arsenal and obviously we're not going to do it against Man City because they're so good but if we do that against Arsenal we've got some sort of chance of at least getting a draw against them so hopefully in the next few weeks we can continue 
the momentum for, from our unbeaten run and get more results. Now to move on to my Man and Match award. But before I do that and give you my Man and Match and why I thought the biggest influence in the game, I'm now going to give you the four nominations I put forward for the award. So unlike our performance against Leicester last week and much like the performances before that, especially the Watford game where we played badly but still won the game, this performance was quite similar in the fact that both teams weren't very good, we were quite lacklustre, Swansea in this case were quite lacklustre, so really there wasn't really any real standout plays for me in terms of changing the game or making an impact on the game which would help either side get a, get a result. But in terms of this game, there's been a lot of debate on social media in terms of who the club nominated, who Five Year Plan nominated, who the Eagles beat nominated. So there's been quite a lot of debate as to which four players firstly should be on the list and obviously who people think was the main man of the match. But I've managed to put four down on the list and this is not to say that these four players were better than the others. I just thought they had a little bit more influence on the game as a whole than some of the other players did. So I could have put other players like Scott Dan for his all right defensive performance. I could have put him on there for as an example. But for me, really, I felt that these four players I'm going to mention in a minute, I thought that they just stood out for me. But do comment below in the comments section whether you do agree with the four players I've put forward. But the four players are James Tonkins, Jeffrey Slub, Luka Milivojevic and Ruben Loftus-Cheek. So just to go through why I've nominated these four players, as I've already mentioned, it's pretty hard in quite a lackluster game to pick players. But these players did stand out for me. But in terms of James Tonkin's performance, I thought, much like his performances have been this season, it was another assured display. He put in a solid shift and there was quite a lot of times where Swansea were on attack, putting pressure on us in the second half. And there was quite a lot of the times where he put in these vital challenges to get the ball away. And also quite a lot of interceptions and blocks to obviously stop the Swansea attacks. And in terms of an interception, there was one in the, first, in the second half which actually resulted in us winning the penalty. So Swansea were on the counter-attack. James Tonkins intercepted the ball, passed it to, uh, to Wilf, back to back to obviously Loftus Cheek, and Loftus Cheek went fourth and won the penalty. So, in terms of influence in the game, you could say that Tompkins had a say in terms of winning that penalty. But overall, good solid performance from him, and another assured display. Now, in terms of Jeffrey Slup, this is one of the debatable ones, and for me, it was between Scott Dan and Jeffrey Slup. And the only reason I picked Jeffrey Slup as opposed to Scott Dan. It's purely because he did actually try and make an influence on the game. So Jeffrey Slup in the game, although it wasn't his best game, I thought he tried to get forward as much as possible. And actually, especially in the first half, there was quite a lot of times where he was putting in a few good crosses into the box, which ultimately, people like Scott Dan, when we were up for set pieces, he was able to get on the end of them. So not only did Jeffrey Slup try and go forward, but there was quite a few times where he put in good crosses. And that's what made me put him above Scott Dan, because although Scott Dan... Much like Tompkins had an assured display, I thought that Jeffrey Slup had a little bit more quality going forward. Not the best, but he had a little bit more quality, hence why I've put him on the shortlist. Now, Luka Milivojevic, where is there to start with him? You know, the penalty was absolutely fantastic. The fact that he kept a cool head, obviously with all this debacle about Benteke missing the penalty and taking the ball off Luka. In this game, obviously Benteke wasn't there, but Luka stood up, calmness personified, took the penalty right down the middle. Very powerful, fantastic penalty. But other than that, I thought he was overall really solid. And the only downside about his performance is the fact that he lost Ayu on the edge of the area. And obviously Ayu went to school. But if you look back at it, Ayu's done a lovely dummy to dribble one way, then dribble the other way. Luke has been absolutely sold on the floor. And then Ayu shoots. So you could blame Luca for that. And personally, yeah, he should have stayed on his feet. But other than conceding the goal, because there are other players who could have blocked the shot as well. Other than that, I thought he showed a really good uh, display. And much like he's been in recent weeks... It wasn't only his defensive performance was good, but in terms of using his quality on the ball was good as well. Now Ruben Loftus-Cheek, first place to start with him, much like Luka. Luka scored the penalty, but Loftus-Cheek won the penalty. And much like Jeffrey Slup, other than winning the penalty, I thought that he tried to get forward as much as possible. And actually, Loftus-Cheek was one of the players who came closest to, to scoring in the first half. So in terms of having an influence and impact on our game, in terms of getting a chance to score for Palace. Loftus-Cheek, you could say, is actually one of the first players who actually got a chance for us to go forth and score in the game. But in terms of Jeffrey Slap's performance, very similar uh, to Loftus-Cheek's in the fact that they tried to get forward. And because Loftus-Cheek was pushing forward, he obviously 
uh, managed to win a penalty. So obviously he gets the assist for that, even though it's not technically an assist, but he got the assist for the penalty because obviously Fernandez, very stupid defending from him, put his leg out and obviously lost his cheek as he's running through on goal. He stuck his leg out and obviously he's been tripped up by Fernandez. So obviously some could say it's a soft penalty, but he stuck his leg out, stupid decision. And Loftus Cheek was great there. The fact that he could use his pace to get in behind and obviously cause Fernandez to make a mistake for that penalty. But all of these players here, you know, Tompkins, Slup, Milivojevic, Cheek, Loftus Cheek, I thought they all had a pretty good influence on the game, albeit Slup and Tompkins' defensive performance and Milivojevic's defensive performance. And also the fact that Jeffrey Slup and Loftus Cheek, they both tried to get forward as much as possible and create chances for us. And that resulted in Slup putting in a few decent crosses and obviously Loftus Cheek using this skill to get in behind and obviously win the penalty. But in terms of the man of the match, I personally think, even though there's been a lot of debate about it, I think it's a no-brainer for me. And I'm actually going to give it to James Tonkin. So congratulations, James. You don't get a certificate or a trophy, but you do get my sincere congratulations on what was once again another solid performance from you. And the only thing really for me that stood out in terms of his performance is the fact that he kept Swansea at bay for the whole game because Swansea City, obviously, they're got a new well they've got a temporary manager in they were really up for this game and although it wasn't the best game it was pretty scrappy they had their fair few amount of chances and I thought that Tompkins done really well to make these blocks and challenges to stop Swansea and if it wasn't for him and it w if it wasn't for how immense he was in his performance I'm, so, I'm sure Swansea would have had a few more chances and obviously someone like Spironi would have had more saves to make and linking to Spironi Spironi didn't have that many saves to make purely because of how good Tompkins and Dan were in front of him. But James Tompkins, another solid performance from him. Hopefully he can remain fit and his partnership with Scott Dan can grow and help us in the next few games. So now you've had my match report, player rankings and my man of the match. That concludes this week's podcast. Now I've got an exclusive interview with Roy Hodgson and Luka Milivojevic following the game. Luka, what's the feeling in the dressing room after that game? Honestly, I am re a little bit disappointing because I expect to take three points. But in in general game, we played well, and uh, in the end, the point is is fine. Yeah, the first half they had a lot of possession at the start, but once Palace got into it, it had a lot of chances, didn't you? Yeah, exactly. After first twenty minutes was a little bit problem for for us. After that, when we take the ball, when we keep possession, we were a very dangerous team. We had three, four, I think, chances very very good and was unlucky, it was 0-0 after the first half, but in the end, OK, 1-1. And you stepped up to take the penalty. And were you feeling relaxed before you took it? Yeah, I, f I felt OK. I felt OK. I exactly know where I want to shoot, and thanks to God, they score. And for their goal, it was just a, it was a great strike, wasn't it? A hard one to stop. Yes, the guy, I was thinking uh, he going to shoot, I slide, because I was late a little bit, and he made good dribble, and then amazing shoot, and it uh, was a nice goal. And Finally, just a, there's quite a lot of games coming up. We've got Arsenal, Man City and then Southampton. What's it like for a player playing that amount of games in a short space of time? How do you prepare? We played the uh, last few weeks. Uh, we had a tense schedule and we have to be ready for that games. That games are, how to say, the best for, for play. You play against the biggest team in the, in the league. And we're going to try to do best for our... Uh, for our team, will not be easy, sure, because three games for next six days is hard, but we have to be ready for that. We're a point away from home today. Can we get your thoughts on the team's performance? It was very solid, I thought, defensively in particular. I thought we were very solid, despite the fact they keep the ball so well, move it so well and play so deep and uh, obviously try to suck you forward uh, with their back players passing it along the line. And then side to side, but I thought we dealt with that well. I thought that our back four was, was, was very good throughout. Uh, and I thought we were very dangerous on the counter attack. I thought both both Andros and, and, and Wilf looked like they're going to be a constant threat. And Ruben Loftus Cheek had another extremely good game. So when we scored the 1 0, I was rather hoping we'd get a second one and make life a bit easier for ourselves and go away with all three points. And had we done that, I don't think anyone could have said we, we wouldn't have deserved it. But Unfortunately, they, they got themselves back into the game with that excellent strike from IU from just around the edge of the box, which was unstoppable for Julian. And as a result, at 1-1, you know, that that tends to change the complexion a little bit because you don't want to be throwing too many players forward and running the risk with them having their tails up and the crowd behind them conceding a second goal. So 
I'm, I'm relatively satisfied with the point today. I think we deserved it. And uh, it's another game unbeaten, which we've got to be happy with. And also it's another brick, if you like, in the wall of this house or castle we're trying to build because uh, we need to keep getting points wherever we can and not suddenly start to believe that we're going to put a run of four or five wins together and shoot up the table. That's, that's not realistic. You said it all in one answer. Merry Christmas. Very good. Thanks to you. So there you have it. Now you've heard what Roy Hodgson and Luka Milivojevic had to say after the game. That concludes this week's podcast for the game against Swansea City. But make sure to comment next week for a post-match review of the game against Arsenal. So thanks for listening and remember to up the palace. Up the palace.